up for a good teaching there. So turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Last night, Paul taught on the mystery, talking about the one body and why that's important. And the practical application of the mystery really starts with the love of God. It really is a big deal to walk in the love of God. So we'll be looking at the love of God as well and amongst some other things. We're going to do a little study on uh, how, to re- how we're supposed to treat one another. Treating one another, things we're supposed to do to each other and things we're not supposed to do. Now this isn't exhaustive, it's a few things. I wish I could do all the things that, that it says because it's really an amazing study. But we'll start with love, loving one another. So you turn to Ephesians, i got to turn there too. And thanks Victor for allowing me to teach, asking me to teach. It's a re- really great privilege. So, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is the practical side of Ephesians. Once we start reading into this, we see, okay, now that all the things that God has done for us through Christ, now this is what God wants us to do. That's why it says, I therefore, after all the stuff that has been said in chapters 1 through 3, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation or the calling wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So we're to forbear one another in love. And that, that means kind of the, similar to the, what she just said. It is what she just said. You kind of cover up some of those things and you put up with some of those things that people, uh, n- people need to be loved. They need love. You know, a person needs love most when they deserve it the least. And that's what allows people to change. When you're dealing with people, you're going to have, just like with babies, when you have a baby, you're going to have a lot of dirty diapers. You know, you don't go, oh, one more dirty diaper and I'm getting rid of this baby. (laughs) No, okay, clean. And then pretty soon the baby gets potty trained and you don't have to deal with diapers until you have another baby. Uh, So... So for bearing one another in love, it's, it's an incredible uh, privilege, really, to forbear one another in love and to love people. Uh, in the same chapter, in verse 32, we'll see another one another, thing, one another usage. Verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, grudging toward, no. oh, being bitter towards one another, no forgiving one another. And then this is what's a really great principle. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. If you have trouble forgiving people, it means you don't know how much, and you don't know and believe how much God has forgiven you. So you read Ephesians 1 through 3, and you see what God has done, and you, it'll help you forgive people. Forgiving isn't always easy, but it is simple. God forgave you for this? Okay, I can forgive this person. And as, the longer you live the more you have to forgive people, the more you'll realize, okay, they need, people need love, people, I need to be kind, tender-hearted. The other thing is uh, the Sower's program, the Sower's principle, the first principle is acquire an in-depth spiritual perception and awareness. And when you're helping people, you get an in-depth spiritual perception and awareness, you see the stuff that fills diapers in people's lives. And that means your love has to grow even more. You have to forbear with love. You have to be kinder. You have to be more tender-hearted, more forgiving. Because people, people are people. We are people. We, I, I know I want people to love me when I, don't, when I don't deserve it. I know I want people to forbear with love my life. I know people have. My parents sure have. Victor sure has. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's something for another day. Turn to 1 John, we'll see the same principle of recognizing God, what He has forgiven you for, helps you to forgive. Well, and understanding who God is, it also helps you to love people. So in 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, really cool thing, the commandment is to love God, the commandment we have is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. What's really cool is God's the only thing you can love with everything. God asks us to love with everything in our being, love Him. And we'll be able to love other people with that. 
If you put anything in that position, I love video games with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. You won't hang out with your girlfriend when you're doing the video games or your wife or whatever. You know, that, that's a conundrum that some people have. But if you love God, you'll be able to love other people too. If you, God is actually, in order to love God, you have to love other people. We won't, we won't read that in here, but if you read through 1 John 4, it says, how can you love God whom you haven't seen and not, not really like love your brother who you have seen? And as, as we will see some more, as we love each other, that's, people will see that love and know that we're Jesus Christ's disciples. Okay, we'll get into verse 7 of chapter 4. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, guess what? Doesn't know God, for God is love. So you can flip that around. Man, I really have a trouble loving somebody. Well, what you can do is, I just don't know God enough. I don't really know what God has done big enough for me. Because once you do, you can love that person who cut you off in traffic. Or you can love that person who, you know, I live in New York, so there's a lot of things where you have to really work at not reacting to just the rudeness of everybody. I can love that person who did not look behind them when they opened the door and just opened the door slightly and got through and didn't hold it for me, you know? Very rude. But it's like, okay, instead of going, well, I'm going to do the same and I'm going to slip through that door to a... No, I open the door, I look behind me, oh, there's somebody there. Why don't you go through? And then I keep going. Just those really basic things. Anyway, those are the kind of things where the small things of showing the love of God really build into the big things. Uh, let's see. So if you want to love bigger, there's two things you need to, to be able, you need to have in order to love with the love of God. You need to be born of God, and that's when you get born again, Jesus, believe Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, then the, she doesn't have it here, but the pour, you know, the <laughs> pouring out, then you get it, but then it's knowing God and believing. You can know what the word says about God, but once you believe it, then you will love people. When you believe that God did all the things you did, He did for you, then you want to love Him. You know, why is it that we do the things we do? Because I love God that much. I love God big enough to do the things that I wouldn't normally do. I helping people and you know serving in those capacities. Okay, verse eleven. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Once again, learning how much God loved us helps us to love other people. The other thing that's important to understand is we weren't good enough to ever be loved. It wasn't like, okay, God, I know you loved me because I was really good enough to be loved. And it was the opposite. I did not deserve love, but God still loved me. And now I learned that, and now I can believe it, and I can love people who sure do not deserve love from me. But because God loved me first, I can love others. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. How do people see God? They see God through our walk. People can see. Have you ever heard the saying, nobody, uh, no, people don't read the word? They won't read the, the scriptures. They'll read you first. You know, and if you're, not a, if you're not a good ambassador, a good witness, they won't want to follow you. I, had, I have people at work, uh, I've had people at work before, Come, be combative towards what I do, you know, for, towards the word, towards going to fellowship and all this stuff. And I ask him, I say, what do you do that I can change my life to follow what you do? And it puts them on the spot and they go, you don't want my life. That's what they'll say. It really is that simple. It's like, oh yeah, that's r really clear because I have a life that's worth living. I have a life that if you believe the word, you'll have a great life too. I can't promise you my life, but I can promise you an awesome life because God's word says it. Okay, turn to John 13. I love how some of these things are, you know, none of us planned what these teachings were. And none of us were like, oh, hey, what are you going to teach on? Oh, that's great. That sets me up for this teaching. Well, no, she was up there and I, the whole time and thinking, wow, that's great. I, can, I don't have to go so deep into that one because she hit it so hard. That's awesome. But we'll still go to it. John 13. Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have, I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love, if you have love one to another. So this is how people know. An interesting thing, it's kind of like a paradox of life. You ever notice that you can, it's easier to love people you have no idea what their life is like, and it's very difficult to love people that you know everything about them? <laughs> like, oh, you know, uh, my, like, for instance, siblings. Siblings are very difficult to love. This is one that I've had to work very hard to not let my siblings get under my skin because they know how to. They know how to press those buttons. My mom's laughing because she knows <laughs> firsthand. But then you ever seen the other side of it where people love, you, you love just the people that you're with, but anybody else outside, even believers, you're not. You, it's the opposite. It's like you're a stranger. I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, stranger, oh no. Uh, Every, every now and then uh, we have kids in our fellowship and I'm like their uncle and I'll drive around and this is, I get from my dad and his southern, uh, his southern ways, I'll wave at everybody. And Noah, he'll be in the, in the car and he goes, who is that? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes, why'd you wave? Why'd you wave? So th this, is a, this is a very different uh, thing you don't really do in the north. The north doesn't really understand waving at you if you don't understand it. They, they actually, it freaks them out. But <laughs> if you wave at somebody and you introduce yourself, then you're no longer strangers. Then you can show that love, that same love. I had a uh, girl that I witnessed to when I went to Chile who know no English, literally none. And all I did was I saw that she had a need. We were, we had these little, um, we were uh, sandboarding in, in this place called Viña del Mar and really beautiful. You can look at my Facebook to see the pictures and videos. It's really awesome. But this girl, we had sit-down sand, uh, sandboards, and she had a stand-up. And she was sitting on her stand-up sandboard. It's just pretty much like a snowboard made to where you can go on the sand. And I said, here you go. Use my sit-down one if you're going to try sitting down. And it opened up the door where I couldn't speak the word to her because I don't know Spanish well enough. But the believers that were with me could. And she saw the love that we had to each other. We asked her, what was the thing that got your attention? She said that you guys shared everything. Like, that you guys were sharing with me, whom a complete stranger. Very, very cool. It really blessed me a lot that she could see that, even though we, we literally, it was this whole conversation I had with her. I'm definitely my mom's son, where I thought I was, knew what she was saying, but I didn't. It just so happened, ironically, I, what she said to me, I was able to, she said she was from some city, but I thought she said she did this for an occupation. <laughs> and it was like this kind of, anyway, it was a whole inside joke. Turns out, I, it just so happened ironically that the city was the, what her occupation was. So anyway, uh, but she, totally lost in translation, but she still could see the love of God. That's something that's universal. Okay, Galatians 5. We'll go to Galatians 5. <laughs> Galatians 5. Galatians 5, and in verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now this is another paradox, a really cool paradox. The more you serve, the freer you are. It's, it's kind of like hard to put, wrap your brain around, but if you aren't serving and serving with the love of God as your motivation, you go back into bondage, as it says here. Uh, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because if you're just, if you are into yourself and you're not looking for others, you're not looking to serve, you go back into this flesh. You're just walking by the flesh, and that's never good. You know, you know it's always it's icky, and, and it's not the best. And then it goes into, here's a one another that we're not supposed to do. But, verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You know, and that's pretty harsh language. That's pretty... That's a huge figure of speech. Obviously, it doesn't mean if you take a bite out of somebody's skin and chew it and all that stuff. It means tear people down. Tear them down. Be, beware, because what you reap, you'll sow. Or what you sow, you'll reap, rather. What you sow, you'll reap. If you're tearing people down, you will get torn down. You will be consumed of yourself. So if you give love, guess what you get back? If you keep giving love, you get love back. 
Now, it might not be immediate. It might not be like, man, why am I? I loved this person that day, and they did not love me back. <laughs> why not? It's not like that. You just keep loving. You keep serving. You keep giving. And people change. People will change. But if you just bite and devour people, because people in the world just bite and devour each other. That's what they do. And if you fall into that trap, everybody loses. It's no win. Nobody has a chance to change. You're, you know, you're all not a good witness, and you're not loving, and you're not pleasing to God. And life's just, it's kind of flat at, at best. Uh, so you want to serve one another. You want to edify each other. You don't want to just fall for that trap. So turn to Romans chapter 14. We just have a couple more. So, th so now we're getting, so that was love. There's tons more of the love one another. It's like 80% is like love one another, love one another. That's like, you know, uh, Jessica was able to go through the ones in Romans that I didn't have time to. So that was like a win-win. But Romans 14, it says in verse 19, it says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Now we follow after, that word is the same word for pursue or like persecute, like, fought, like chase, like that you're after this, like I am, I'm right behind you. You ever played tag with somebody? You're like, I'm almost, I almost got you, I'm going to get you. <laughs> We're supposed to do that, follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. How, how can we build this person up? Sometimes loving, you know, Jesus Christ walked with love all the time. Sometimes loving might not seem what it feels like it is. You know, is it feel loving to be reproved? Not all the time. Can you reprove and be loving? Yes. Can you reprove and not be loving? Yes. But why would you, why would you want somebody, why would you want to reprove somebody? Because you want them to be their best. You want to restore them back to the proper way of living, the proper things that they're supposed to do. And, but that's edifying. That's how you edify each other. Not necessarily in that, but you're looking to edify. You're following to meet, be, you know, it says follow after things that make for peace where one may edify one another. We're looking to edify. That means to build up. Not to tear down, not to bite and devour, to build up. All right, we have, we'll, we'll do a few more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a saying, and I had heard it before, but recently at one of our fellowships in Auburn, there's a um, Grace, at Grace McNabb's house, they have a poster, and they must have got it from somewhere, but it says, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. You know, and, and I thought that that was really cool, because if you want to change, if, if you really want to ch make a great change out here, you've got to start in here. You start in your own mind, in your own heart, and with the people that you are close with, and you teach that love, and then that spreads, and then people start to grow. It's the same with edifying people. It's the same with serving. People will respond to those things rightly. Now, they may not respond immediately, but it takes, it takes time, but that's a great force of change, is the love of God, is, is looking to serve, looking to edify. That's a great, great force for change. Okay. Chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians in verse... 25 is where we'll start. That there should be no schism or divisions or, you know, um, cuts in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the, mem the body of Christ and members in particular. We're supposed to have the same care one for another. The same care. Like, I care for you as much as I care for myself, really. And when you care for yourself, you take care of yourself and you do all those things. And Because we're one body. If you ever had a, a limb or an appendage or something not work properly, especially us that are getting older, I know I'm, I'm still young, but there are times when <laughs> something doesn't work properly. Like, if your pinky's not working properly, I don't go, get out of here, I don't need this pinky anymore. You know, it's like, no, something's up. It's not functioning properly. What can I do to help it function? Oh, I heard it doing this, or it got tired, you know, doing wheelbarrow work, you know, and all that stuff, and I, or my forearm and all that stuff. It's not working properly. Well, you rest it, or you do the things it takes to take care of it so that it can get back to functioning 
properly. So we can do that for each other. We can care for one another. And I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to go to there, but I, I want to point out a few things of examples in the word about that, that care for one another, that care. In this epistle, in Corinthians, it's a reproof epistle. And it's very clear that it's a reproof epistle. It's like, you guys are going to law with one another. You guys are like having sex with your father's wife. You guys are speaking in tongues out of order. You're not speaking in tongues as much as I. I speak in tongues more than you guys. You're, there's all these divisions. There's all these schisms. And it's like, okay, very clear that this is reproof. And reproof is when you practice wrongly, it's bringing you back to the right, right doctrine, practicing right doctrine. Well, Philippians is the reproof of Ephesians. And Ephesians is living the mystery. Ephesians is, is the doctrine of what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ and seated in the heavenlies and all that great stuff. And Philippians, when I first learned that it was reproof, it, I never saw it. It wasn't like, they're not doing crazy stuff. They're not going off on, you know, and, you know, going to judge Judy with another believer or whatever. They're doing, you know, but what is it that's being reproved? Because it is a reproof epistle and it's uh, in understanding the mystery. The first, Dr. Wuerl in the uh, study uh, the church, the great mystery revealed. He said the first step away from the mystery is just not acting in light of the mystery. In the, it's literally just not acting what got the, in light of the mystery. It's not having that same care and that same love. And there's three examples in Philippians that are really incredible. Are, there's the Paul's example. He says, every time I think of you, I pray for you. Every single time I think of you, I pray for you. That's pretty cool care. And if you're not caring for somebody and somebody tells you, hey, hey, uh, I know you've been caring for me because I've been caring for you. Every time I think of you, I pray for you. It's like, man, that's reproving. And that's the reproof I like to get. I don't like the full on like, hey, you've been messing up real bad. I like somebody saying <laughs> like, hey, like this is the word. I'm doing the word. And you're like, oh, man, I'm not doing it in that area. Thanks for the example in the internal reproof. I could be meek to that, you know. <laughs> then another one is Timothy. In chapter 2 of Philippians, it says, I have nobody that cares for you like Timothy does. So Timothy also cares for them. And he says, I'm going to send him to you. I want him to tell you how I'm doing. And I want you to tell him how you're doing. And he'll come tell me that. And then there's Epaphroditus. And he, these are three men who their lives were examples of that care for them, for the church. Care for those believers in, in Philippians. Even so much so that uh, Epaphroditus, it says that you guys knew he was sick. He's not sick anymore. Thank God. It's awesome. You know, uh, that would have been sorrowful for everybody involved. But uh, he was sick because of the work that he was doing for God. You know, it doesn't say what he did, but this is the care he had for the church, care for he had for the, for the people. He didn't care for his own life. He cared for you guys. And those are those examples. And then we'll close in 1 Thessalonians. Isn't it cool what, what we can do one to another and what we're not supposed to do? It's pretty, it's pretty cool because like, it's easy to not do what it says to not do. Like, okay, forgive. It's simple. You do it. Okay, don't bite and devour. Don't fall for those traps that the world does to other people. The world will, ve you know, it's very difficult to live in the world and love people. It just is. It's very simple, but it's not easy. It is not easy to love people who they don't care. You know, you, it's, it's why when we're around believers, you know, tell somebody they're walking with God. If they're walking with God, tell them. You know, my mom brought two king cakes and, you know, and the king cakes that you guys had to make. You know, and it was just cool that she didn't know that and she was walking. That was really a cool thing. It's a small thing, but the world won't tell you you were walking. Oh, thank you for not reacting when I was not being nice to you. The world doesn't say that to you. Your, your, your workmates won't say, man, that was so walking with God when you didn't flip out. <laughs> you could have. I know you could have, and I was really trying to make you flip. But, but, you know, that's so great. I'm so glad you renewed your mind and did not do that. The world won't do that. But believers can really, you know, you really understand when you live in the world and you're out there in the world, you have a secular job. You know, most of us do. We have to deal with people. You have to deal with bosses that are unbelievers or not practicing believers or you have to deal with coworkers or you have to just deal with people in general. And we can still walk in love. 
I have a lady, this is just a little side note, I have a lady that I helped, um, I don't, I'm not in support, I'm in hardware, I fix computers for a living, that's what I do. And this lady was, it somehow happened to where I had to answer the phone for her. And she made it to, she was like, everybody hated her. Every, she's like very nasty lady and all this stuff. And I, and I just loved her. I just turned up the love and the kindness and I said, I'll take care, you know, oh, we'll take care of you. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and just calming and peaceful. You know, I said, oh, good thing, good thing you called us. We're the computer, you know, we, we can do this. We can help you. And then she said, and there's in a note in there, it says, whenever, I call, whenever she calls, send it to Dylan because he's, <laughs> he's the only one she wants to talk to. <laughs> And that's not even my job. So, you know, these are things you can do in the world. Okay, so we'll finish up in this last one. And last but definitely not least, it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. It says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, what, the word, what are the words it's talking about? This is the hope. This is the revelation of the hope is revealed right here. That the dead in Christ will rise, that we'll get to meet, meet them in the air, and we'll be forever with the Lord. That's really great to remind each other about, to comfort one another with. Uh, the first time I ever remember this happening was my mom. I, had, I was in like sixth grade, and as a sixth grader does, or at least I did, I procrastinated on a project until the day it was due, like the absolute morning, and I told my mom, Mom, I'm freaking out, like I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't even, it was a science fair project, and I hadn't even come up with like a hypothesis, and I know we've all been there, but, um, uh, been there, not necessarily that bad, but you know, we've all kind of had that thing. And my mom said, Sp speak in tongues, Christ could come back. And I went like, oh yeah. <laughs> I was like, this really isn't that big a deal. My sixth grade teacher, you know, is not, this isn't, this isn't going to affect, you know, through all eternity, I'll get to spend time with God. And it was something really cool for, e so even for a little kid, I was a little kid, but that edified me and that comforted me even though I fail, totally failed that, you know, that thing, you know, <laughs> totally blew it and, and bombed it. Well, you can remind each other about that. You know, you can remind each other that when Christ comes back, will this matter if Christ comes back? No. An F on a sixth grade science fair project, you know? No, it won't matter. And that's really great also, obviously, for the people where we've lost loved ones. If you stood for any amount of time, you've lost believers, believers that are falling asleep. And we can comfort one another. We'll see them again. We'll get to see all our loved ones again. And they'll have perfect bodies, perfect minds, and we'll have perfect bodies, and we'll have perfect minds. These are great things to remind each other about and to comfort one another. And we'll do, there's one last one in verse, in chapter 5. It's the same, same thing. It says, verse 11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. You know, you could keep doing it. Keep doing it. You keep loving each other. Keep serving each other. Keep forgiving each other. Keep being kind one to another. Keep, um, you know, having the same care. Reminding each other about the hope. Reminding each other about uh, the things who we are in Christ and comforting one another with these truths. So that's, that's what I had to share with you this morning, and thank you.